Hello and welcome to Switzer TV Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. Well, the theme of tonight's show is when does someone get into the market? Is it too late or can we wait for another significant leg down? In early 2009, I asked Ibis World's Phil Riven, what does our stock market rebound by after a significant bear market crash? He told me anything between 30 to 80% in the year that follows. Now, March 2009, our market went from, wait for it, 3,145 on the 5th of March to 4,870 by the end of the year. Now that was a 55% bounce. So the index was a good bounce product if you're buying an ETF, but how well did the CBA bounce, for example? Well, keep in mind that the overall S&P ASX rose by 55% between March and December. The CBA went up 53% over that period of time. But if you had the guts to get in on January 1 when the market was still falling, the CBA actually returned, wait for it, 97% across 2009. So the question is, you know, do we buy stocks now or on the next leg down that could have those kinds of magnificent returns? We always got to keep in mind what Warren Buffett said to us, you know, be greedy when other people are fearful. But the question is, is it too early? So to tackle the issue, I have Anthony Doyle from Fidelity International, Julia Lee from Bourbon Invest, Michael McCarthy from CMC Markets, Charlie Aiken from Aiken Investment Management, along with Paul Rickard, and of course, myself. So let's kick off and ask Anthony Doyle, is it time to get into the market or not? Well, when I get to uh, think about the, the challenges ahead on the stock market and other financial markets, I always like to talk to Anthony Doyle, who's a cross-asset specialist with Fidelity International. Mate, thanks for joining us. Hi, Peter. How's it going? Well, I'll tell you what, if uh, the market was about 20% higher, I'd be comfortable. 40% higher, I'd be happy. It would All be right. flat. <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> All, right. All right. So apart from that, let's just talk about what you're seeing. I, I know I wrote a story the other day where I said, I'm not watching economic statistics anymore. I'm just watching infection and death rate statistics. How about yeah. you? Yeah, I mean, obviously, as a strategist um, and the market, we're putting a lot of emphasis on the rate of transmission. And uh, as you say, that data is updated on a daily basis. So we're putting a lot of faith in how that progresses and tracking the rate of transmission. And the market is fully focused. That's the most important chart in the world. They're the most important statistics in the world at the moment, largely rendering the old data obsolete. You know, unemployment claims over 6 million in the US. I've seen forecasts of a 30% unemployment rate in the US. So the data that's coming out is largely meaningless. But the big question mark is, how long are these suppression activities or suppression tactics being placed on the Western world going to remain in place? And that's the big question mark. Yeah. So I guess one thing a, a big organisation like you tries to do is try and answer that question. And what have you come up with? <laughs> I think we're as much in the dark as anyone else. Um, so the economic modelling that I've seen or the statistical modelling that I've seen from Imperial College of London suggests that some form of suppression measures will be in place until a vaccine is found. So that could be 12 to 18 months. And I saw University of Sydney modelling on the Australian economy and the Australian experience, which is likely to uh, suggest a similar um, a similar projection in terms of coronavirus cases. If you lift the suppression measures too quickly, well, then we just start spreading it again. So we're likely to see a phased opening up of these economies. But one thing to keep in mind is that the borders will likely face restrictions for a considerable period of time in terms of immigration and migration. Hmm. What, what about the, uh, the idea that, um, for example, the... NRL is, is, try, is putting forward the idea they might be able to play footy by June 1. Does that surprise you? Yeah, I, I think it's certainly. You know, you don't want to undo all the good work that we're doing at the moment in, you know, working from home or if you have the ability, keeping your kids from school. As I said, it just takes one person to start spreading the virus again and 
the cases will quickly uh, build up and overwhelm our health system. Mm. So I think that that's very optimistic on behalf of the NRL and it remains to be seen whether that can be done. Yeah. What are you seeing around the world that's making you either positive on one hand or negative on the other? Sure. Um, well, why don't we start off with the positive? And the positive is very much Asia, you know, the epicenter of the crisis. Um, so China in particular was the first country into the crisis and is leading the way out now that the rate of transmission has started to flatline. And in terms of our conversations with companies that we're having on the ground in China, many companies are reporting back to us that they're operating at 80 or 90 percent capacity. So it looks like China has come through this and very um, targeted stimulus measures as well from the Chinese authorities in supporting Chinese economic growth. And it looks like a V-shaped recovery there in China and obviously the regions that are leveraged into the Chinese growth story. The big question mark now is the shock to demand. So on the negative side, it's economies like Italy and France and Germany, UK, the United States whether they can uh, exhibit a similar type of trajectory for their own economies. And there has been an awful lot of stimulus thrown at this on the monetary and fiscal side. And uh, it remains to be seen whether we start to follow that V-shaped trajectory once we get the rate of transmission under control. Okay, and I think I'll hold you up there then. If, if China's been able to go back to work to such the stage that you're saying 80 or 90% capacity, why won't we be able to do that? I don't think there is, there is a, a case that we can't do it. Um, but don't forget that in terms of our own economy, we've got a very different economy to China's, one where they have a much larger manufacturing base. Ours is much more services based. So I think what we're likely to see is the gradual easing of these suppression measures that have been placed on the um, Australian society um, over the course of the last few weeks but it will be a very slow and gradual process now china interestingly uh, once they uh, started to open up again they've now shut their borders down because they were finding that the um, rate of coronavirus was starting to pick up but predominantly and mostly from people entering into china rather than person-to-person -person transmission right so i guess that's the point that the, the, the change in our, the way we operate may well be that for, for three months or for six months, we're all wearing masks. We're, we're, we're living life differently, but progressively, more and more people might be going back to work, more and more activities become acceptable, but some clearly won't be. And one of those big challenges will be allowing people from overseas where coronavirus clearly is a problem as evidenced by the, the Ruby Princess issue, that could be the kind of restriction that's imposed on us for a long time. I think so, Peter. So we'll see you know, those people that are potentially less susceptible to the um, tragic uh, repercussions of, uh, of getting coronavirus. So those that are, are most at risk potentially uh, think about obviously continuing to self-isolate. Um, you know, those with autoimmune deficiencies or, or of um, an older age and gradually opening up the, the economic uh, hibernation, as it's been described, uh, over the course of time. All right, so w when the, the market fell in Australia by about 36% or so, that was uh, driven by total uncertainty and no understanding of what the government or central banks might do. Now, we've seen we've come back, um, what, 10 or 15% since that low, uh, and I've, I figure, well, that was... That comeback was because, okay, well, the stimulus is bigger than we expected and the reserve banks and other central banks' actions are, are greater than we might have expected. What's potentially going to be the next leg up or the next leg down for the stock market? Yeah, so, I mean, the initial violent sell-off and indiscriminate sell-off that we saw over the course of March for risk assets and Aussie equities in particular was really driven by excess leverage, technical selling, and hedge fund selling rather than those patient long-term investors that are willing to accept higher volatility for the potential of higher returns over the long run. So I think we overshot on the downside and the appreciation that we've seen since the lows reflects a more natural level of where we are now. So I think we're in a 
very much in a holding pattern. We have a lot of bad economic data to come through and whether the market looks through that. We have earnings revisions, we have dividend cuts, uh, we have capital raising. So there's a lot of uncertainty which suggests this holding pattern for Australian the Australian equity market in particular will likely be in place until we start to see the economy uh, back to firing on all cylinders. So I would suggest that the outlook until the end of the year, until the fourth quarter of this year, will be one in which we see these 2% up days and potentially 2% down. So, so we trade in a range uh, mm. until we get some further uh, certainty about the outlook. So, so therefore, a, a big leg down would be because the, the battle against the coronavirus doesn't head in a positive direction. It's, it becomes worse than expected. The flip side would be that the battle gets better and the, the rate of suppression is easing up quicker than we expect? In the short term, yeah, I think so. I mean, if you saw some really bad numbers coming out of the US on coronavirus, uh, I think that would be a huge hit. Uh, the world investment markets would take a very large hit because there's nothing you can do in terms of dropping interest rates or putting money in people's back pockets that is going to address the spread of coronavirus. But it looks like now that, you know, President Trump uh, and uh, the health authorities in the US are taking it obviously very seriously and are starting to get things back under control. Okay. So what are you doing for, for investments now? What's your, what's your strategy? So uh, from a multi-asset perspective, we're underweight risk assets um, globally, uh, but that would mask some differences at a regional perspective. So we're overweight Asia. Uh, we're overweight emerging markets, but generally underweight developed market equities. We're neutral Aussie equities, which suggests remaining invested at this point in time. Mm -hmm. On the fixed income side, we are uh, overweight investment grade corporate bonds relative to high yield corporate bonds and building up cash to deploy in the future if markets do take another leg down. Okay, Anthony, you got me marginally excited. The fact that you said you're neutral on Australia, Australian um, risk assets. Is that for, for, for two reasons? One is uh, we seem to be doing okay, very well, in fact, on infection and death rates, but also our link to China and Asia is going to be an important thing for us. I think as Australians, and I know very much um, you're of the more optimistic tilt, and uh, me as well, you know, as, as I said, you know, I'm a trained economist, 15 years in bond markets, and I find myself the optimist. You know, in terms of Australia, we've come into this with much lower debt to GDP than other developed economies. We have a fantastic healthcare system. We are doing an accelerated rate of testing of coronavirus higher than other developed markets in the world. And I think importantly, we are leveraged into the China uh, economy in terms of our own growth, um, rather than say Europe uh, and all the difficulties that Europe has in generating economic growth at this point in time. So I think that there are reasons to be optimistic, definitely. Okay. Now, is there any better question I should have asked you that I haven't asked that you, you could tell me what it is and then you could give me the answer to it? <laughs> Look, it's just so uncertain. And I think that uh, for me, in terms of the conversations that I've had with our clients and, and your, your own client base, I think it's important to retain that emphasis on the long term and not get caught up in the noise. Focus on diversification, focus on the long term, and there has been indiscriminate selling by so-called professional investors that has opened up some fantastic opportunities for active stock picking at this point in the cycle, sort of once in a decade or once in a generational type opportunities for some great businesses. Well, apparently um, some um, one of my critics on Twitter called me a dinosaur to believe that you could have a buying opportunity than sit and hold it for a long time. Is that, am I such a dinosaur that I'm actually missing some better investment strategy? Well, that's what makes a market, isn't it? The interaction of uh, positive and negative views. So, uh, yeah, I mean, look, when you think about going defensive now, never has fixed income yielded less. It will do a job in your portfolio as a uncorrelated or a diversifier. But if you're trying to generate returns over the long run, or meet um, savings goals over the long run, I think that risk assets and equities are probably the place to do it. Anthony Doyle from Fidelity, thanks for joining us.
Thank you, Peter. Hi, Julia. Thanks for joining us on the program. Good pleasure, Pete. All right, now, Julia, um, mark us up nicely today. Um, I go ask this question. Are you in the mood for catching knives? <laughs> <laughs> We're actually seeing the third consecutive uh, week of increases for the Australian share market. So that's a positive in the short term. And if you do want to trade the shorter term moves, then it's a great environment to do so because we have seen some really strong bounces. But we know that overall in a declining market that sometimes the most violent moves are those moves up, not so much the moves down. So look, I still think there's a bit of pain to come and I think we're not going to see a V-shaped recovery here. So there is still a substantial risk around the earnings side of the equation. And as an analyst, that's the key to longer term outlook, trying to evaluate the earnings side. So very hard to do in the short term. Um, if you do want to evaluate it, it has to be looking out sort of two to three years to get any indication of value. And, you know, when we're looking at the PE ratio, um, the bottom part of that, of course, is earnings. And when earnings are being downgraded so quickly and there's so much uncertainty, it's really hard to get a handle on value. Well, that's the point, Julia, that even the people trying to estimate what the earnings will be, I'm, I'm including the CEOs of the respective companies, they don't know when we're going back to work, do they? And I, I know I was interviewing an expert uh, recently who said it could be three months for Australia before we get back to work properly, but he then said that 90% of China is back to work. So, like, you know, we could be, we could be back on June 1 with the football players, you know. We might be, we might not, but... Working out the earnings is going to be so hard to, to do it with any sort of convincing uh, credibility. Look, I think you have to look at three potential cases here, a, a bull market case, a base case, and a really bear case for um, the earnings recovery scenario here in Australia. And look, at the moment, if we have a look at the COVID trajectory, that's looking pretty good here for Australia. But as we've seen from other countries like Singapore, just because you've seen the first wave under control doesn't necessarily mean that the fight is over. And Singapore at the moment is seeing its second wave of infections and it's seeing its highest amount of daily infections in this fight so far. So look, there's a number of scenarios that can play out. In terms of companies, I guess you can have a look at the COVID-19 impacts, look at it from a balance sheet point of view, and look at companies that are actually looking relatively stable throughout the COVID-19 experience as well. And those companies that are looking relatively stable throughout the experience, which will probably continue to pay a pretty good dividends, are those ones that have benefited things like the supermarket, like Coles, uh, Metcash, as well as uh, Woolworths. And look, some of those companies that are cashed up and ready to make acquisitions at the bottom of the cycle like Woodside Petroleum and West Farmers and food's not looking too bad here either and I think uh, Costa Group's looking pretty interesting here as well as Elders and Bigger Cheese is looking pretty good here as well so look there are still some interesting lower risk plays on the market but in this environment it's not just all about trying to evaluate the potential blue sky but it is really about managing those risks. Mm. Um, when America starts seeing its infection uh, wave or its curve flattening and falling, what do you think Wall Street will do with that? <laughs> Look, I think at the moment there are so many people looking at this as a potential opportunity to jump into stocks and that tells me that we've probably got a bit more on this journey to go when you are seeing um, people that aren't even in finance looking at getting in at cheaper prices and we call this phenomenon in the market grounding. We've grounded ourselves to the prices that we saw back in January and February and think that prices look low because we've seen a fall. What people sometimes fail to evaluate is that the earnings side of the equation has fallen by as much if not more than the share price. So when you have a look at it, is value really there? And that's a key question for investors to be asking in this environment. It's also pretty interesting having a look at some of the Google mobility numbers country by country. And of course, the US is the center of this at the moment. And if we have a look at things like retail and recreation, mobility for those kind of activities over in the US 
due to COVID-19 is down by about 50%. Going to things like parks is down by around about, uh, I think it's about 14%. Going to workplaces is down by 38%. And that really tells you the impact on activity and the economy that we're seeing at the moment. And the longer the shutdowns, the harder it's going to be to bounce back from the declines that we're seeing at the moment. So it is about duration and it is about watching the US experience. I tell you what, I wish there was a company that actually had all the suburban coffee shops, which are doing so well at the expense of all the CBD coffee shops that aren't doing any work at all. (laughs) I guess if we have a look at some of the trends that are developing through COVID-19, I mean, I can't live without my coffee, Pete, and I'm too nervous to go out. I actually bought a Breville coffee maker. (laughs) Um, So, you know, it might not be that people are substituting their takeaway coffees from the city with Suburban, but they might be making it at home. And it's going to be interesting watching us coming out of uh, this COVID-19 crisis where we do potentially see new behaviours occurring and new structural changes trends emerging from this experience of working from home as well as the shutdowns that we've seen. So, look, I think it is going to be a bit of a different world when we emerge from COVID-19, which hopefully, fingers crossed, isn't too far off. Okay. You you mentioned a number of companies that will do well uh, over this uh, current challenge period. What's the one standout company that you want to buy at, at low prices if there's another leg down? that you want to hold for the long term? Because all of our our viewers are long-term players. You're sometimes the shortest-term player in the history of shortest-term players at times. But what what is the one or two companies that you really want to buy if there is another leg down? Well, you know, we're coming up to... uh... Uh, Easter, and I call it the Holy Trinity in terms of the Aussie share market, but that's CSL, BHP, Billiton and Macquarie Group. If you do see these shares at substantial discounts, then medium to longer term, um, they are cornerstones of any investor's portfolios. I think CSL, though, is going to be challenging short term, and that's because although 15% of its revenue comes from flu products, the other 85% is from blood-related products. And it, because of the shutdowns, we just aren't seeing that need for blood that um, emergency departments usually see because there aren't as many car accidents because there's not as many cars on the road and things like that. So it's going to be interesting to watch the blood side of CSL's business. Um, collections also might be impacted by the shutdowns as well. Um, but um, look, if we do see a substantial discount uh, in the short term bucket, then that would be a uh, time to start accumulating for that longer term. Great stuff, Julia. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Pete. Last time we talked to Michael McCarthy, he wasn't interested in buying anything at all. Is he changing his view? Does he think there's another leg down or is the worst behind us? Michael, thanks for joining us. Hi, Peter. Now, mate, what are you thinking now? Well, Peter, I am encouraged by the recent change in market behaviour. It's good to see smaller trading ranges, less day-to-day changes. Uh, And over the last five trading days, the market has stayed within a 300-point range or 6%. Now, when we remember that there were falls larger than that, during late February and early March, it does appear that we've had a calming down. However, I don't think we're out of the woods yet, Peter. I'm encouraged. But when a market lifts like it did today by 4.3%, it's still a sign of unusual market behaviour. So I haven't had it all clear, but I am uh, cheered up a bit by the recent trading action. So, so Michael, I think most of us, without any experience whatsoever, are looking at infection rates and death rates and trying to work out when might Europe be you know, getting out of the woods and when will America get out of the woods? And when that comes along, I'm sure the market will like it. But then I guess we have to face the economic realities of when do we get back to normal? And if that getting back to normal is stretched out, that could really spook the market, couldn't it? Yeah, I think so, Peter. I don't think we've fully accounted for the economic damage that's being done. And of course, one of the key issues is how long this crisis lasts, because the longer it goes on, the more structural damage is done to economies and the harder the recovery will be. It looks almost certain, Peter, like we'll be heading into recession this year, uh, not just here in Australia, but around the globe. And how we come out of that and when we come out of it is still a very open question. Mm. Now, given the facts, you know, two or three weeks ago, you weren't interested in even thinking about buying anything. Has your mind changed in any way towards any company from the point of view that 
you think the worst is behind that company and therefore maybe buying might be a, a, a good idea? Well, Peter, I wouldn't be a buyer at the moment, but I have been watching the energy companies very closely. Most of them have fallen by more than 50%. Oil prices are at near historic lows. Uh, and for mine, that means that the medium to long-term direction for these shares and for the oil price is upwards. So that's one of the sectors I've been focusing on. I do note, however, that healthcare uh, does appear to provide a, a win either way. Uh, healthcare stocks will be in high demand during the crisis. Uh, and they're likely to still see good service. After all, you don't put off having uh, an oper a hard operation uh, because you haven't got the money. You get the operation and find the money later. So uh, there are the top performers at the moment. And if I were moving into the market, that's another sector I'd be having a look at. Yeah. Can you? Like we all know CSL and Cochlear and Resmed are, are, are prime performers in this market. Is there is there anyone like, for example, some people keep telling me that Sonic looks like a good buy for a longer uh, uh, point of view. What's your view on Sonic? Uh, Sonic is a reasonably well-run operation and it does have good prospects. One of the keys, though, around their uh, share price performance has been the expectation that the demographic will continue to grow, that there'll be more and more people uh, aged over 60 or 65 uh, and that the pathology requirements around that will be enormous. Uh, that might be the case, Peter. I'm more impressed by Fisher & Paykel. Uh, its share price performance has been stunning. Obviously, it's a great time to be in the respirator business, as they are. Uh, and just as Warren Buffett is selling stocks that are down a long way, mainly airlines, I would prefer in the current environment to be buying stocks that are on their way up. And Fisher & Paykel certainly fits that profile. Yeah, OK. So, Michael, um, another leg down... What do you, do, if there is another leg down, and I, I kind of think there will be, do you think we will test the, the previous lows when we knew nothing about central bank support, we knew nothing about the size of stimulus? Do you think we test those lows again? Well, when we hit lows, Peter, market action tends to be chaotic, and so there's not a lot of logic to it many times. Uh, for mine, though, the marks in the standard now are at 4,800, 4,400, uh, and then 38.50. So I'll be watching very closely if the market approaches any of those points. In fact, I think if it goes below 4,000, I'll probably be buying regardless. Uh, as I suspect, as you rightly point out, that low at 3,100 post GFC is a bridge too far for the current Australian market. Okay. Now, in in previous times when you and I made ourselves look brilliant was BHP. I made the argument to you on TV and you supported me. Well, you know, if we take a three-year view on a company like BHP, I think it was around $14 at the time, and even if it just got to $6 in that uh, $20, there'd be a $6 gain on 14 That's a pretty good uh, per annum return. Is there any company that fits that bill now, an equivalent to a, a, a quality company like BHP that if someone took a three-year view, they would pretty well do well? Peter, I like the banking sector, and in particular CBA. Uh, that big pullback in share price we've seen is important. Uh, the big banks aren't going anywhere, Peter. Uh, their capital positions are very strong. Uh, they've been given permission uh, by regulators around the world to pull back on their dividends to ensure they stay that way. And their position at the heart of the financial system means we're always going to need banks. That's the area I'd be looking at, as I say, particularly like CBA. Uh, but I have no objection to ANZ or uh, NAB at the moment. Uh, Macquarie Bank's an interesting one. I noticed it was trading 92 today. It's a higher risk business, but the potential rewards there could be high for those investors who want to step up to the plate right now. Michael McCarthy, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Peter. Okay, to finish off today's program, I've got Charlie Aiken from Aiken Investment Management and Paul Rickard, of course, from Switzer Report. And we're following the same themes. You know, what are, what are you guys looking at when do you think this market can go higher or do you think there's another leg down? So, Charlie, let's kick off with you. Do you think there'll be another significant leg down or do you think the worst of this is possibly behind us? Yeah, I, you know, I actually think that the worst of it is probably behind us, actually. I think you can see volatility is coming down. You can see the actions of central banks to you know, support bond markets and corporate uh, debt markets are actually working. And I think you've probably gone past the worst of the uh, illiquid panic, but that doesn't mean there won't be, you know, up and down days and volatility from now. But actually, I do think you've seen the bottom of the markets, but it's going to be a very 
choppy recovery and not all sectors will be involved, is my view. Yeah, Paul? Yeah, I think we might have seen the worst, Peter, but I don't think, I think we're going to see in the Australian market, um, I think we'll see now the test down because what we're starting to see now, Peter, is I think what we expect to see lots of capital raises coming to the market and um, you know, investment bankers are really good at driving these things because there's big fees and, um, and I think that's going to create a bit of, um, you know, take care of some of the demand. The other thing is I think the super funds are getting pretty nervous about their payouts, uh, the reports about the numbers of early uh, people accessing um, the 20,000. The the 20, mm. Yeah, and look, while these are just uh, demand issues, Peter, they can have an impact on sentiment. So I think some of that little buying that's be there might just be fa might fade. So look, I, I think you can never get, this volatility can't last at that sort of level. I agree with Charlie, that's a good sign, volatility coming off. Mm. I don't think we've necessarily got out of the, the yeah. sort of the rut. So I'm, I'm sort of for another leg down, but I don't know whether it's going to test new lows. Yeah. Um, Charlie, do you think the, uh, what, what is going to be the, the big issue that can make this market sneak up or take a leg down? Well, it's obviously the, the uh, infection rates. I mean, everyone's watching that. And you can see even today, you know, globally, S&P futures are up the regions, up Australia had a good day. It, and that's a little bit of slightly better news out of Europe over the weekend in terms of infection rates, in my view. But look, we're still dealing with, you know, enormous unemployment out there, huge disruption to business. You know, it's a there's no quick fix here. This is not going to be some V-shaped recovery. So, you know, we need to just set expectations that it, it, this will take time. But I will say one thing about super funds. Remember equities, the greatest advantage of equities is actually daily pricing. So when you're a super fund, the first thing you can do is sell equities and get your money back in two days. And so that was the first thing that's been sold. So I'd be more concerned about unlisted assets from this point on, actually things that haven't been revalued down and a lot of these unlisted, you know, private equity type businesses. So I think, you know, I think equities have taken the hit. I think there's opportunity in it, but I really don't think it's going to be some instant recovery. Um, Paul, do you think there's going to be a time when the economic data starts to mean something again and, and you'll then look at the implications on earnings? Because you know, at the moment the price has gone down, we have to find out what the real earnings is going to be going Yeah, forward. I mean, I think the market is sort of, yeah, absolutely, I think the market is sort of guessing between, is this a, is this a three months disruption or a 12 months disruption? disruption yeah. and we really don't know the answer to that question and that's going to be the impact on earnings because uh, we can all see possibly a quite a quick recovery if it's over um, and I think the market sort of okay we can see the data coming out of Europe as Charlie says that's positive the US looks like it'll peak maybe the next couple of weeks that could be a positive if they peak uh, but we still don't know how long the disruption is going to be and that's probably the bit that's um, still worrying I think a few investors out there so yeah. I, 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 I think any economic data at the moment is meaningless <laughs> Um, and it's, a, it's, it's really an, a guess about, you know, how long are we disrupted for and then what's the pace of the recovery, how quick is it? And uh, at the moment, that's just best guess at the moment. Yeah, Charlie, have you been doing any buying? And if so, what stocks have you been buying? No, we've done nothing much, Pete. We've been you know, reasonably fully invested through this. And that's actually worked quite well because we've got the hedge of the Australian dollar, which takes a lot of cushioning out of the, uh, out of the fund. But no, we've just been taking our time. Like, you know, I think that the last thing you want to do now is just deploy too quickly or just because something's gone down. You don't actually have, you can't be certain about what their earnings are going to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we've actually been very quiet, just making sure that our companies have fortress balance sheets because this is about liquidity. This is about getting through, right? So if it's three months, six months or 12 months, your company has to get through. So we've been spending a lot of time on balance sheet and, and coverage ratios and free cash flow, et cetera, just to make sure that our, all the businesses we own can see, can see this through. Right. So, Paul, have you been doing your buying lately? Uh, look, I'm... Uh, no, no. Look, look, yeah, Peter, look, I, I bought too early, and I'll admit that. And I, told, I thought uh, initially this was, a, you know, just the dip we were waiting for. Mm. Uh, I didn't actually anticipate just how, um, how much disruption there would be. I didn't expect business was going to close and, yeah. you know, unemployment would go to where it is and that we'd be walking around in uh, worrying about our social distancing um, all the time. So I, I underestimated that. I got that wrong. I bought too soon. Um, now, look, I'm, I'm having a little nibble, Peter, but I've I got a feeling we're going to, I always said I thought we were going to work, work around 5,000. I picked mm -hmm. that for, I like big number levels. I think the Dow's going to work around 20,000. I agree. I think there's still a couple more dips down here. You'll get a chance. So I agree with Charlie. You just don't know uh, how long it's going to last. So um, I think 
what we do know is is that you know two out of the three parties and governments and central banks have come to the party, no yep. doubt about that. They're doing everything they can to help. The question is, you know, for me, the, the data is improving, but what obviously the, the governments are worried about is there a second or third wave to come? That's still a bit unknown. Uh, and so how long is this disruption? Until we get a slightly more comfortable feel along the length of the disruption, I think it's I think you can afford to be selective. Also, as I said, wary uh, that there are going to be a lot of companies do capital raisings, and yeah. you'll get a huge chance to buy here. We saw just this morning, we saw five or six companies uh, announce a raising. There's more to come. Yeah. They will happen. Bankers are really good at driving this behaviour. And you like yeah, those, those are often those are often good opportunities in the GFC. Those recapitalisation deals were great opportunities, including the Commonwealth Bank at twenty seven dollars raised a couple of billion. So all these. Um, all these trans transport and tourism related businesses, like today, I think it was Auckland Airport, Flight Centre. I actually think that, that there's opportunity in those recapitalizations. I mean, if you think about like Auckland Airport, I mean, it'll, it'll be around for the next hundred years and the coronavirus hopefully won't be. So I, I think, yes, a lot of them are banker driven, but they're also boards going, well, we actually need cash on our yeah. balance to see this through. And if you can, if you don't own one of those stocks and you get a chance to actually participate in those um, yeah, equity issues, they can be quite, quite rewarding through time. I, I think you made the point better than I could make. I was just saying that'll give you a great opportunity to buy because that was probably the number one lesson for an investor out of the GFC. It was those capital raisings were the best times to buy. Mm. And while I know boards are looking at it, I mean, I'm a director, so I know what's involved here. I'm just saying the market is really good <laughs> at, at getting an outcome. Uh, and I think there's a lot, many more of these to come, Pete. Okay, well, in the coming weeks, we'll identify those particular companies. Uh, Charlie Aiken, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Paul. And that's the show for tonight. Obviously, we'll keep watching those infection rates. It's great to see Australia's coming down. Let's hope America can deliver, as Chris Joy said towards the end of April. If they keep coming off the wall, that would be a very good thing for the markets. And next Monday, being Easter, we're doing a special. We won't be recording on the day, but ahead of it, we're getting together a whole lot of people we think are, are legends of the market to see what they think's going on. We ask them the same five questions in rapid fire, and we'll see what they're thinking right now. That's the show for tonight. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.